Amen. Take your seats. <clears throat> there are um, multiple topics I'm studying at the same time. I've been asking God a lot of hard questions because one of the things that is really concerning me at the moment is the lack of power being seen in the church. And um, it really upsets me because the enemy is trying to put, and it may not hit everybody because some people are oblivious, but the enemy is trying to create a sense of embarrassment about being a Christian and a sense of um, a lack of regard. So there was a time if you said I was a Christian, people were like, okay, then where'd you go to church? But now it's like, you're a Christian. There's a, a sense of disdain. And so I've been asking God a lot of questions. And I know it's part of the enemy's attack, but the reason why the enemy's been able to form this attack or any attack that the enemy creates or forms is based on the patterns and behaviors of human beings. Every attack, every plan, every strategy, everything that the enemy creates to stop us or to hinder the body of Christ is born out of watching us. So our laziness, our lack of commitment, our lack of focus, our lack of drive, our lack of passion, all these things are distractions. The enemy watches and has watched and sees certain generic patterns that human beings have. And then he's able to create a plan that he knows will work with certain types of people because of how we behave. And so oftentimes, although we're rebuking the devil, we should rebuke ourselves. Because the fuel he has to create the weapon is the fuel that we give him. And so I've been asking God a lot of questions. And this one thing about the church has been really grieving me. It's been really grieving me. It's been upsetting me. And I realized the more I began to think about it, that this upset wasn't my upset. It was from the Holy Spirit. It was something I was feeling in my own emotions and heart. But it was so overwhelming, I began to realize it wasn't coming from me. It was something that I was sensing in the spirit. Amen. And so the Lord has had me, had me looking at certain things. Um, been looking at renewing the mind. Been looking at the, the ability to believe and love. And for the last couple of weeks since Pastor spoken to me, I said, I prayed and spoke with the Lord. And he wanted me to speak. No, I knew I was going to speak about belief. I assumed belief would be first. And then I was corrected yesterday when I took my notes and started to try and type it. So I had my notes written. If you know me, you know I like to draw spidergrams and lots of offshoot. And I took it all, all the scriptures, all the things I'd written down, all the things I'd searched through the Bible and began to type. But I, kept, I could feel this, uh, 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 uh. Why do I feel really uncomfortable typing what I know you've given me? Uh, 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 uh. And as I stopped typing it, it went. But this is what you gave me. So I thought, well, I'm just going to leave you. I'm not going to try and work it in my flesh. We listened to a message. And then some pastor said something. And then I got the confirmation. Today we're going to talk about covenant. The greatest love affair. Covenant, the greatest love affair. And... Um, <sighs> The Lord asked me a question a few weeks ago, and he said, do you believe that I love you? And your natural, trained response is yes. But when he asked me, he was telling me something. You don't believe I love you. Not really. Not deep down when it counts, do you believe that I love you? And it broke me so much. I closed my Bible. I closed my notebook. I wept. I wept. And I felt so embarrassed that the way I should love him wasn't right. 
that I was loving him on a very human level. I was loving him based on um, physical, natural, human relationships. And I was using that feeling, that passion, that type of drive to then try and love him. Ah, forgive me. <clears throat> so, we're going to talk about the greatest love affair. Covenant. Now, there are a few attributes of covenant that the Lord has really been talking to me about. And we know this scripture. And I said, Lord, I don't want to touch that scripture because people think the scripture is really cliche and they don't really listen. But he said, do what I said. So, we're going to do what he said. And I've got lots of scriptures. So I hope you've got your notebooks. If you're taking notes with your phone, can you wave your hand at me? Because one of the things that challenges us as preachers is because we can't see what you're doing on your phone, all we see is phones. And we, are you reading your, thank you. Are you reading a text? Are you taking notes? What is happening? Amen. So get rid of all distractions. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's why everything was in harmony today. The worship, if you listen to what Nadine was pulling on, if you listen to what Pastor was pulling on. I didn't tell him what I was speaking about. So please be open. Please hear what the Lord wants to say to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's read from verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So I'm just sound. I'm just noise. There's nothing to me. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Let's just stop there. That's what love is. That's it. There's no complaining. There's no murmuring. There's no pride. So we can choose. We can either love of ourselves or we can love the way he does. Amen? Still with me? One of the other features or attributes of love is loyalty and commitment. And without loyalty and commitment, there cannot be trust. One of the other attributes of love and a covenant, because covenant is, you can almost interchange the word covenant and love. And I'm using, as I'm led by the spirit, love to define covenant. You've got to have loyalty and commitment to have trust. And you cannot have love and you cannot have, you cannot have the manifestation of love in all its attributes without loyalty and commitment. Because if I don't trust you, I can't believe you. And if I don't believe you, I have no faith in you. And if I have no faith in you, I cannot see anything manifest. And this is why we sometimes struggle in the manifestations we don't see with God. Because we don't really love him, we don't really trust him. Yes, I do. But look at how many times we do things of our own strength, our own opinion, and our own will. Knowing God says there's another way to do things. And we justify it with I prayed and God didn't say anything, so I'm going to do it. No, 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 the word speaks. 
the word speaks. Dreams and visions and confirmations from other people should not be the foundation for how you make a decision. Those are external confirmations. But the word that you read bears witness with you and you act accordingly. You don't need pastor to confirm it. You don't need a dream. You don't need a text from your friend or to pray with your prayer buddy. What does God say about that situation? And that's how you operate. Otherwise, we can't access God in that area because we're not operating the way he says to operate in that area. I'm going to read a statement from Papa Jonathan, our spiritual covering. When I say ours, that's ours, over. There must be progressive commitment, loyalty, and trust in all healthy relationships. There must be progressive commitment, loyalty, and trust in all healthy relationships. So you can already begin to see, just for yourselves where you're sitting, where there are areas where there's not progress in your relationships, there's mean, that means there's something wrong. Because relationships should progress, evolve, improve, become better, not reveal more of the opposite. Relationships must grow. When a child is young, he or she looks for certain things in the father and mother. When he or she gets older, he or she does not require the same things anymore. Why is that? Because trust has been established. It's got to the point with our children, for example, when I say I love you, they go, oh no. But I want to tell you, yeah, but we know. Do you really know, mommy, we know? When they're smaller, the communication was more frequent because we wanted to build something into their understanding that became a part of their knowing. So they know whether you're in trouble, not in trouble, did well, didn't do well, we love you. We love you, I love you, all of you. Do you love me more? No, I love you all the same. You're all different, but I love you all the same amount. You love TJ as much as you love me? Yes. And over and over and over and over and over again, through the consistent repetition and my commitment to them and my loyalty to the children, they know that I love them. To the point where now I don't have to confirm it to them. But yet sometimes we as believers, we always want God to tell us he loves us. Why? If we know it, know it, know it, why do we need to be consistently assured that he loves us when he gave the best of what he had before we became flesh? Why does he have to say anything else concerning his love for us? Because I couldn't sit still and watch anybody put any of my kids on a cross. I'd find a machete, an axe, a hammer, a gun, and I would kill the whole lot of them. I would not have the capacity to sit there. Just want to leave. <laughs> Just so you know. So for a father to sit back and let his son be given so violently and brutally for us, I don't know why we feel we need to be assured that he loves us. Because when God says, I'm cutting covenant with you, he starts with death to himself. He starts by saying, I lay myself down, I humble myself, I will become of no reputation for you because I love you. That's how I show you love. I don't need to keep telling you because what I say is what I do. So I gave everything I have to show you how much I love you. Place, case, closed. Now let's get on with how we're going to live together. Because I proved to you already that I love you.
That's my commitment to you. That I gave something that I can't take back. There are certain things that we need to wean ourselves off. There is an invisible but visible attack that the enemy has launched on all human beings. And that is one of self-worth, identity, and knowing who you are. What do you mean? Pastor keeps telling me stories of all the men in the gym, obsessed with getting the best biceps, six-packs, quads. <laughs> They're all becoming carbon copies. Individuality is disappearing. If girls don't look like this, you don't cut it. If men don't look like this, you don't cut it. If you don't drive this car, you don't cut it. If your house don't look like this, you don't cut it. If you don't dress like this, you don't cut it. If you don't go holiday here, you don't cut it. And although it appears to be, yeah, these are nice things to go for. Yeah, why can't we have the best? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, an, there's a trap in that attraction. Because when the moth gets too close to that light, it burns. It's the wrong light we are being drawn to. That I must become something that I am not and forsake who God says I am. So we have to wean ourselves off of the standards of the world telling us what we should be. And we must put our attention on the one who gave far more than any stylist, Gokwan, magazine, Instagram post, filter, no filter. And get our focus on the one who knows why we are here. Our confidence has to come from who? Him. When Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, I love you. Do you love me? I love you. I, lo I told you already I love you. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments then. You see, church is not really complicated. Serving God is not complicated. It's very, very easy, but we want complicated because then we can ignore all the things we don't really want to do because we're lost in the complication of serving God because it's deep. Because when I'm lost in the deep, hidden things of God, I'm not living by the commandments because I'm not talking to you and I don't like you and I'm not forgiving that one and I'm vexed. But I love you, Lord. He says, no, you don't. He says, no, you don't. And we're, God, please, God, please. God, why, why are you asking me for anything? I've told you the conditions of our relationship. Don't be a fraud, as I used to say back in the day. You're a fraud. Go back and do what you know you should do to walk with me. Then you'll have access to all of these things. Amen. 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 If you love him, you will keep his commandments full stop. No matter the cost, no matter the challenge, no matter the difficulty, no matter the humiliation, you will keep his commandments because your love for him outweighs your own sense of pride. But we like to preserve self. No one talks to me like that, you know. I'm sorry. God knows. God knows. No one talks to me like that. I'm not taking that. God knows. I know I must turn the other cheek, but I must tell them. They need to know. But when they were thumping Jesus in the face, whipping him, humiliating him, the creator, not another man, not another being, the creator that was there in the beginning in Genesis when God said, let us, come on, 
Let's share this love that we have. Let's make beings that can understand like we understand that there's nothing more beautiful, sacred and holy than sharing love between partners. Come on, like how we love each other. Let's give them the chance to experience this bond, this covenant, where we give ourselves for each other. We love each other. We trust each other. We rely on each other. We want to share that. Let us make man in our own likeness and image. We've taken on too many other images. And they're all just definitions of pride. And pride is not an attribute of love. And pride is not an attribute of God. You know, I'm going to tell you a story now, and I'm going to take out all the names. A friend of mine called me this week. Someone who's been walking with the Lord far longer than me. Who, who is revered more than me. To talk to me about something that I thought was so basic, it alarmed me that you didn't know. And it went something like this. God told me we must do this and he doesn't want to do this. And we got into a bit of an argument and I said to him, I ain't got time for this. And I went to bed and left him. And then now he's not talking to me properly and I've tried to talk to him. And I got my other brethren to talk to him and he's still not listening. So I said, first of all, your attitude was wrong. Because even though you're right, your whole attitude is wrong. Because all he's picking up from you is... I know, you don't know, listen to me because you're wrong. And until you admit that you're wrong, you are out of order and I will leave you to serve God, you know. Because that's what they said. I said, is that what you said? She said, yeah. But now he's not, he's now, now he's not what? He's not talking to me. I said, babes, first of all, you've got to go back and fix that and you need to repent. You need to tell him you're wrong. Because he was reading your tone of voice, your body language, your facial expressions. He wasn't reading your words. Dr. Jonathan says it like this. Although many times a woman of faith is right, you have to get past her attitude, her tone of voice, her body language, and listen to what she's saying. I don't know many men that will do that when they're vexed, you know. So I said, you need to go back and fix it. And what you need to say to him is the truth. I said, I understand that you're frustrated, but your frustration is coming out of a place of, I need things to work now. And I said, I understand that because that's how women are. We like to get things moving. We make, we build, we, we like that. And they cover and protect. I said, however, you can't take your frustration out on him because you two are partners. So you need to go to him and you need to say to him, I was frustrated. I'm sorry. I had no right to take it out on you. This is why I'm frustrated, because I don't want us to miss God. Why don't I want us to miss God? Because we've missed him so many other times. It was fear and frustration. I was vomiting on you, and I'm wrong. I'm sorry, because I need us to do this together. Then the text comes back, I love you so much, woman of God. Thank you. I says, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> because the Bible says love holds no record. The Bible says love is patient. The Bible says love is kind. The Bible says love is not provoked. So if you find yourself getting provoked, impatient, vex, holding record of wrong, you're in your flesh. And that's not covenant. And the power of the covenant of God will not manifest in that flesh. Because the flesh is not dead. He only appears in dead flesh. The irony is the only real zombies on the planet should be the children of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Three key functions of love. Three key functions as to why God has given us love. On a human level, 
the first reason we have love is to love him. The first reason God made us is to have fellowship with him and for him to have fellowship with us. He wants to love us. He wants to love on us. He wants to demonstrate his passion for us. So the order is you and God. If you and God are not right, your relationships will not be right because that's the pattern. You learn how to operate in the dynamics of love with God because God is love. And I don't mean mushy because love is not mushy. Love is one of the most powerful forces on the planet. It is the most powerful force on the planet. So with God, we learn how to interact, how to communicate, how to trust, how to be loyal, how to give of ourselves. If you're not doing that part, you can't do this part because you have no grid for it. You're not following a pattern. God is first. Our walk with God, our love fellowship, our love relationship with God is first. Second is family. And that's why so many families in church are mash up because people are not right with God. If you're not right with God, you're not right in your relationship. And please don't try and tell me that you are because the Bible does not say so. Because how I love him is what I've learned from God. How I communicate with him is what I've learned from God. And what I've learned from God, I take the pattern and operate in that in my next level of covenant relationship. Family. When you honor him and you love him, the way that you operate in these relationships changes. There's truth with respect. There's patience. There's kindness. There's no record of wrong. This is the weakness of the body of Christ. The lack of love. And I don't mean hugging each other, because you can hug me and you don't like me. You can love me and you ain't forgiven me. You can love me and you was talking about me a few days ago. So that's not love, please. Hug me and kiss me on my cheek. Judas did that. And Jesus said, hurry up. Hurry up and do what you're doing. So I don't count that. I've always said, I don't watch what you say to me. I watch what you do. It is what you do, because that's what I learned from him. To show me he loved me, he sacrificed his son. That's demonstration. So love is sacrifice. Love is not pride. Love is not saving yourself and saving face. Love is going lower and lower and lower and lower and lower till you're dead. Your flesh is dead. Your pride is dead. And if you don't want to do that, you will never have right relationships. <laughs> because if Jesus can take the fault for us and not defend himself, how dare we defend ourselves? Jesus wasn't in to blame. He wasn't in fault. I didn't hear him say, actually, if you lash me like that again, I'm going to call down my angels, you know, because I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't hear him say, you can put me on the cross, but if he speaks to me like that again, I'm going to cast you down. That's why the Bible said he was a lamb to the slaughter. You can't have love without death. You cannot have love without sacrifice. So the first level of covenant is between us and God. The second level of covenant is between us and family. Now, you see, if you're bringing God into it, all things will work well, even when you don't agree, even when you're not friends, even when you don't want to look at each other. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, because you've given God room in that relationship, will say, go and say sorry. Yeah, but God, go on. okay.
for the sake of the covenant, for the sake of love, you go low. For the sake of preserving, for the safe, sake of protection, for the sake of life, you go low. You don't go high. The next level of covenant love relationship is church. You can't talk about each other and then think there's power in our prayer. It's impossible. You can't talk about pastor and criticize how he does things or I do things and then think that when we pray over you, it's going to catch you. Because God does not bless rebellion or disobedience. Imagine, and now God is, okay, yeah, I'll keep going. I'm taking off script. With the children of Israel, they were God's chosen people. Did he let them get away from the consequences of their disobedience? He did beat up the enemy afterwards, but they still had to suffer the consequences of not prevailing, not winning, not breaking through. So that lets me know and us know straight away that if you violate the principles of God and the commandments of God, you shut down access to the totality of that covenant relationship. Because these are the same people he protected, brought through the Red Sea, but then these are the same people that he allowed the enemy to beat down, whip, burden, enslave. Think. So you cannot have right relationships in the house without there being a manifestation of that. In the same way, you cannot have wrong relationships without there being a manifestation of that. So if we are holding record of one another, the power is already short-circuited. If there's unforgiveness between one another, the power is short-circuited. If there's no commitment between one another, the power is short-circuited. Because the attributes of love are clear. And if the attributes of love are not there, then the totality of the covenant cannot manifest there because the platform has not been made conducive for the manifestation of the power and the promises of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I wonder if I should stop now. <laughs> okay. Oh well. Covenant is life. Can you write this down? Covenant is life. There is no life without covenant. Covenant is life. There is no life without covenant. You see, we think covenant is something separate to a relationship. But relationships have been born and created out of covenant. So life comes from covenant. What comes from covenant? Every aspect of life comes from covenant. So covenant is love. So covenant will manifest honor. So covenant will manifest commitment. So covenant will manifest strength. Love, honor, commitment, strength. Covenant will manifest fellowship. Covenant will manifest compassion. And if those things are lacking in any level of your relationships as believers, there is something being violated. Let's go to John 17, 
John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Verse 1. And I'm going to keep reading till I feel the Spirit say stop. John 17. Verse 1. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to men whom you gave to me and out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believe that you sent me. I ask on behalf, on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I'll stop there for a moment. There is an exchange that happens in this relationship. Giving, receiving, humility and honour. That's covenant. Jesus gave himself because God gave us to him. Then he gave us back to him. Jesus said, I'm not of this world. And those that are of me are not of this world. Because they've become like me. That they can experience what we have together. And those that are not of us don't understand our ways. That's why although we live on this planet earth, we are not of this earth because we are of the Father. And because we are one with the Father, those that are not one with him are not a part of us. That's covenant. We have to merge with him. There has to be a merge. And I don't know how many people have seen this film. I suggest you watch the film. It's called Pacific Rim. And for them to move, there has to be partnership. But not just partnership, they have to mind merge so that they can see each other's thoughts and know what each other is thinking to do to keep the enemy out. So in the film, you don't see him saying, lift up your right arm so we can punch that beast. 
you just see them both pull their arm back and hit. Because while they're in that machine, they become one. We should be able to mind merge, life merge with God to such an extent that we don't need him to say, I love you. We don't even need him to tell us what to do because we're open to him and we begin to understand his commandments and we operate out of his commandments. In actual fact, that level is elementary. The longer you walk with someone, the less they should have to explain themselves as to this is how I am, this is how I like my chicken, this is how I like the house, this is the aftershave. All those things you are aware of because of the commitment, the loyalty, the consistency. Pastor doesn't have to tell me, don't make the chicken too spicy. You know, I don't like too much chili. I want flavor, but don't burn my mouth. He doesn't have to tell me that now. At the beginning, he did. But when you walk with someone and you know someone, there are some things you don't need to say because they're elementary. You move on to deeper things. But we come to him and we say, God, I just need you to tell me that you love me. Go and read my book, he says. That's why you'll hear some people say that the Bible is a love letter from God. God, should, should I take this job or should I not take this job? But all of those questions that we ask are coming from a place of insecurity in the relationship because we don't trust him, because we're not really committed to him, because we don't really love him. Because to know him is to love him. We must fall in love with him afresh. It is the only thing that will keep us. It, was, it is the only thing that will sustain us. It is the only thing that will keep us understanding that we must never let go of him. If you remember the original intent... John 3, 16 says this, God so loved this world that he gave his only, his only son, that whoever would dare to believe in him, and that don't just mean, yeah, I believe in Jesus. You gotta believe in him, trust in him, commit to him, walk with him. That kind of belief I believe you're going to keep me in this test. I believe you're going to protect me. I believe you're going to watch over my children. I believe that there's salvation for me that can start here now before I cross over.